Hey everybody, welcome back to Physical Therapy Private Practice, Secrets of the Top 10%. My name is Brian Gallagher and I am excited to be talking to you today about a topic that so many of us want to avoid, run away from, ignore, neglect, or push off to somebody else. But the reality is it's those things in your practice that are actually holding you back from being successful as a CEO and practice owner. So some of the key administrative elements are number one, how to properly interview and hire and close somebody as a candidate for your practice. Number two, how do I get them properly credentialed and enrolled in the insurance carriers that we are providing care for, that we are servicing within our practice? Or number three, if we step way back, uh, I'm a new practice owner and I'm opening up my clinic and how do I get contracted with the federally funded payers and the commercial payers and so on. So let's take up some of these topics and let's discuss some of those things. And then of course we'll have some fringe discussions uh, around this whole topic of contracting and credentialing. So for you PTs who are new and you're going into private practice, contracting is different from credentialing. Contracting is whereby we have to get our group, our you know, tax ID, our organization, contracted with the particular insurance carriers that service our area. So that is tricky because every single state's a little bit different. States like Arkansas have any willing provider, you can go ahead and submit, and pretty much you're going to be looked at and considered to be in uh, network for any provider that you submit to. Other states like Florida, where Blue Cross and Blue Shield has had a closed panel, very difficult to get into Blue Cross Blue Shield. There are mechanisms to um, best position you so that you look most attractive for them to consider and get you in. But if in fact you are in, you know, and it, the list goes on depending on the states, but if you are in fact in an area where it's challenging to get into particular contracts, with particular providers, you may just need to file, uh, submit uh, uh, an application, and they'll either certify you as a provider or enroll you as a out-of-network provider. I almost forgot my words there. Out-of-network provider. So there is hope. You know, get in there, get get connected, start seeing patients, and then as time goes on, let's just stay on this topic of contracting. We want to gather some letters from doctors who are saying, hey, you really are doing a fantastic job. We would love to be able to send our in-network patients from whatever, Aetna, Blue Cross, Cigna, you know, United Healthcare, whomever, is shutting you out. Get some letters, and I'm talking three to five, of patients saying what great services you're doing. And thirdly, one of the successful actions I would recommend is try to provide a service that no one else is providing within you know, two to five miles of you, whether that be pediatrics or TMJ service or speech therapy or occupational therapy or aquatic therapy. Sometimes the carriers will look at it like, well, we have an obligation to allow our members to have access to these therapy services. And you're right, there's nobody else in a two to five mile radius. It all depends on what state you're in and what carrier we're talking to. So there's no reason for us not to let you in for our in our network to provide therapy care to our to our um, they would call it uh, participants in their insurance. So you are the provider. The patients are usually the participants of the carrier. So contracting is really really critical. You can't necessarily send in a contract when you're a new clinic until you have a lease, a signed lease, and a signed location, and. If you're submitting to Medicare, they may very well come out and do an on-site review, an on-site inspection. Sometimes they want to come in your space and talk to you and look around. Sometimes they'll drive by and look at the door and they want to see the name, the hours, the lights are on, and look through the windows that you're a legitimate place. You're not some P.O. box somewhere or some vacant warehouse uh, garage door somewhere. And that's really what that's all about is to validate and, and substantiate that you are really a practice in business doing business. So be careful because if in fact you send that application in too early, and I'm getting off on a little sidebar here with Medicare, and the reviewer comes out before you're ready, you could be starting all over at square one because they'll deny your contract because you're not an up and running legitimate practice. Boy, isn't that a dance? Like, how do you know when your contractors are going to be done? And how do you know, you know, when you're going to be completely built out and have everything ready? Um, and then how many months do you want to go? 
you know, waiting for Medicare to approve your authorization. So we can help you with that. Um, our credentialing team, Elise is our director. She's super awesome. She knows everything in this area. So by all means, if nothing else, whether we're helping you, working with you or not, at least reach in and get some advice because I want you to do well in that process. I hate to see you have all your payments suspended or held up or, you know, starting all over. Oh, too many horror stories from people calling up and saying, I started the process. I didn't check the right box. It started all over again. Or they came out for the inspection and I wasn't here. It wasn't open. We weren't ready. Uh, it's, I've heard every amazing story you could imagine. And yet this process should be so simple. Don't get me started on my soapbox. It should be like, oh my gosh, submit an application, provide some proof and get approval. <laughs> contracting. So that's contracting. When it comes to credentialing, let's assume that you now have your contracts with your particular insurance carriers. The federally funded programs, every time I say that, I'm thinking Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE. So Medicare, Medicaid, and TRICARE are your federally funded programs. Um, credentialing for them is a little bit different than credentialing for the private carriers. Of course, the requirements and the materials are similar, but not always exactly identical. You want to make sure that who's ever handling this is really an expert in the PICO system. I'm gonna give you that acronym so I say it right. Um, P-E-C-O-S, you need to get your NPI um, number and you, you, you have to use a particular system to be able to do that. And CAQH is also another system that needs to be reviewed and updated and monitored you know, that is the thing that you're really paying for. That is what you're really looking for because this process can be anywhere from 60 to 120 days to get credential, depending on carrier, whether it's a federally funded program or a commercial program. So you need experts in these applications to be able to move this process through, uh, you know, efficiently, I would say. You also wanna be working with somebody who's not afraid to call, pick up the phone, squeaky wheel gets the grease. Where is this? Whose desk is this on? What is pending? What, you know, can I go online and see the status? Is it in progress? Is it pending? Is it suspended? Is it approved? You really, when it comes to this, it's really legwork. It's detail work to get your new hired therapist fully credentialed with all your carriers. That's a challenge. A lot of PT owners are DIYers. I do not recommend it in this area for two reasons. Not to say that you're not smart enough and not capable enough to do the work and get it done, but the time, the energy, the stress that goes into you doing it when you could be diverting your attention to building your brand, hiring new people, you know, achieving higher level of success, a higher net promoter score with your with your patients, um, you know, cultivating greater success in the growth and expansion of your practice, not doing administrative task oriented duties. My big feeling is, and I've gone 180 degrees on this, way back in the early 2000s when I was building my practice, I did everything. I ran the Cat 5 cable, I painted the rooms, I hung the chair rails, I wiped down the tables, I changed the carpeting. What else did I do? I cleaned the toilets, I cleaned the bathrooms, I cleaned the kitchen, I washed the dishes, I did everything. And there's nothing bad about that, but back then when you're doing all of that, now that I reflect back on my 30 years experience and people ask me, what could you do differently? I would have taken on the beingness of an owner earlier. I should have assumed the role and responsibility and the hat of ownership and CEO-ship of my business earlier because every minute I spent, you know, doing administrative duties such as that, that somebody else could be doing, that I could have outsourced to, I could have paid somebody else to do, is a minute that I'm not doing the high level stuff that only I could be doing. So ask yourself, where are you spending your minutes? Where are you spending your hours of the day? What are you spending it on? Like seriously, you are the owner and CEO of the business. Work on your brand, the reputation, the community, immerse, you know, immerse yourself in the community, engage yourself with your staff. Think of the social company culture you want to develop. Think about the patient care experience you want to have, the success stories, the testimonials, the wall of fame you want to build in your office with all the success stories of your patients. Putting that in front of your future patients, your raw public, your referral sources, you have internal marketing, external marketing, 
You have financial planning. You have financial reports you have to go through. You know, what are the 64 key statistics? How are you measuring them weekly? Are you managing with a weekly management action plan, breaking it down into a daily battle plan? Are you putting your key employees on such a system of a weekly management action plan and a daily battle plan? This all spun off from the conversation of do not try to do this credentialing stuff yourself. And I'm not saying it because I want you to outsource it to us. I mean, by all means, use whoever you like. But find a professional who's just dedicated to doing that. You know, I am very proud of the team that we have because that's all they do day in and day out. And they work on your behalf. They chase it down and they save you from yourself. They literally save you from yourself. So let's just go over some of the details so I can kind of give you an idea. I've got a little list here of documents required. Let's say you're going for the contracting side. Well, Yeah, let's do that, and then I want to come back to the credentialing of the individuals so you have a little bit more awareness of what's going on with that. So we'll end this week's podcast a little bit more heavily on the credentialing of individuals, and I'll give you some secrets of how some people are handling that in a better way. So if we were going to take you on and you're a new startup and we're going to have to submit for your contracts, you know, getting your clinic contracted, we're looking at, well, first we have to have a signed agreement. Then we have to have a clinical profile, which we're going to ask you to fill out for us. We're going to need your clinic W-9, your professional liability insurance, your IRS documents, such as the letter 147C, 147C, or PC-575. You know, these are really important documents. Another one that I'm very familiar with is your SS-4. You're going to need to submit that to us so we can use that. We need your business license. We need your lease Uh, a copy or some uh, example or some credibility of your lease location that it's executed and it's uh, it's legit. Um, Some business letterhead so we can verify that you're literally in business. Uh, Avoid a check or bank deposit. Your group NPI two, we're gonna need that. And we have websites and we have links that we give you to help you get this stuff over to us. And we create a portal for you as well, so we can make it really easy. We have a a, a mechanism of working with you on the clinic side. But on the credentialing side, I'm up and running. I've got these contracts. I hired this new therapist. What do I do? How do I proceed from here? Well, again, we're going to need a copy of the resume. We're going to need the PT's license. We're going to need their NPI if you have it. We are going to need to complete or have completed a CAQH on this individual. Uh, The PCOS account for Medicare will need to be set up. So we have a lot of legwork to do and then a lot of follow-up to do after that. And maybe some of this stuff's just going right over your head. And it's, it's honestly, it's... Just work with somebody who knows what this is all in, all the ins and outs of this, and then you can just go and do your part to submit and get the documents and get it off your plate, like literally get it off your plate. So that's the conversation I want to have on on hiring. Um, People say, well, when can my therapist start? I mean, I don't have numbers yet and whatnot. Well, they can often see workers' comp patients. They can see cash patients. um, They can, you know, shadow on interview uh, interviews. (laughs) evaluations with your evaluating therapist. I mean, this is still a licensed therapist, right? So um, you can do that. In some instances, there's some backdating to when the application was uh, verified that it was in process. And from that point forward, you may be okay to have your therapist seeing some patients and the claims are being held. And then they're gonna be submitted once the numbers are retro back to the date of, of service that the therapist is actually administering. We can help advise and guide you depending on where you are, what state and what insurance carrier we're talking about. So there are certain things, there are certain little tricks of the trade that you can do that are ethical, that are legal, that are okay, that are permissible, um, but you need to know which carriers are willing to do that, which ones aren't. And we're totally happy to share that with you so that you can get that person up and going. But there's also admin features and functions that this person can do to help build your brand and build a reputation and do some, um, you know, some crunching of numbers and some analysis for you, maybe some marketing contributions, maybe some environmental changes. So there's always things to do so this person can be highly productive. But what we like to do is from the minute that we know they're hired and they've accepted, we want to get that paperwork out the door soon. Do not drag your feet. Time is of the essence when it comes to enrolling your new physical therapist provider in your insurance contracts. So we can help guide you with all that. Again, this has become such a specialty. It's so frustrating. They, you know, as time goes on, I find the simplest things in life are becoming more and more complex. It's your job. It's my job. It's our responsibility together to cut through the cheese and get to the bacon. I, I don't even know if that's a saying, but just streamline what we need to do. And part of that is 
Take off the plate the things that are stressing you out and are, are just time consumers and get yourself into the buffet line of the things that are just most important to you as a PT practice owner. Good news and last message for you on this podcast is tomorrow, the 16th of May, we are having a Zoom cast with our director and she's going to be going over all these questions, difference between credentialing and contracting, in particular hangups that people have and she's gonna describe the whole process to you in greater detail than what I just did, but she's gonna also be available to answer questions. So please do get on our website, Meg Business. Dot com, go to our website and go to the links below. There should be a link to the Zoomcast. It should be very informative. It should be very helpful to you. And if nothing else, really gives you a comfort level that you've made the right choice and her level of expertise as to what she's doing. You get to see her, talk to her, and um, hear her directly yourself. So I highly encourage that. That's it for this week's podcast. I didn't want to hit something like this for a very long time, but I did want to let you know that it is relevant, it is significant, and is extremely helpful when you have a credentialing department that can work between your front desk and your billing and handle this admin feature and function for you. Fortunately, for the way we work, people are probably wondering about pay. You pay per per provider per carrier, so it's it's very straightforward. You know, for each therapist that you want each insurance. Uh, company enrolled credential that's what you're paying for you're not paying for fluff you're paying for the actual results so there you go everybody i wish you the best i know this is a very tough topic to confront but honestly you have bigger fish to fry put this in somebody else's hands and do the things that are going to build your brand build your practice build your patient satisfaction and build a company culture so everybody wants to be beating the door down to work for you as always start each and every day expecting to do well